is here with us this morning, uh, Pastor George Bloomer of uh, Durham, North Carolina. Let us give him an apostolic church of God. Welcome. Turn to your neighbor and say, Navy, if you have any intentions. Oh, come on, you have to do a little better than that. Say, Navy, if you have any intentions. You're going to have to do better than that. Look them in the face, eyeball to eyeball. Stop looking at their neck and their hair and say, if you have any intentions of hindering me, of receiving my blessing today, change your seat right now because I come to praise him. Can I get a witness in the house? We honor the Lord for being here on this, on this fine morning, and to Bishop Brazier, we salute the man of God for this house. Amen. Put your hands together for this wonderful, great leader. Gracious and kind God, we ask this morning that you'd come into this house and minister to our needs. We pray that the message that would go forth would be one that you prepared for your people's hearing. Our delivering of that word should bring us a corporate testimony that it was good for us to be here. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Second Timothy chapter number two, verse number 19 and uh, 20, and then we'll see where we go from there. While you get it, I'm reminded of a story that I read in a magazine um, flying across the country to some city, to some conference somewhere, of two sisters who had terrible luck in the area of relationship. I mean, they tried and they tried and to no avail, it didn't work, so they got together on one afternoon and decided that they were going to leave men alone. I'll say that again. They decided that they were going to leave men alone. I'll say it one more time. I'll say it over here. They decided that they were going to leave men alone. Psh. And they pulled their resources together and decided that they were going to build a company. They were going to put their energies and their education together and make something great out of themselves. Being products of the 30s and um, going through the Great Depression, they had a number of issues that wasn't settled with them. They had the poverty issue, they had the trauma of the Great Depression, a number of things. And so, although they became very successful, there were some areas that were unconfessed and some areas that they never dealt with, that they were now confronted with in their season of success. They got the big house, the wonderful cars, the security, everything that goes along with it. They built a great big company. And because of their past, and they couldn't shake the poverty issue, they saved everything they could get their hands on. Old newspapers, bottles that uh, you could turn in for deposits, aluminum cans. You named it, they saved it. Until this great big mansion was filled up with a lot of junk, stuff, trash everywhere because everything had a value and everything meant something to them. And in this wonderful house, the splendor of it couldn't be seen because they had to make paths to walk through because there were old newspapers and frames and just crates and stuff and old plastics and just stuff, just trash. And because they couldn't clean the house properly, the house began to stink. And because they had issues with economics, although they were very rich, but still traumatized from their past, they didn't take their clothes to the cleaners as they should. So whatever smell was in the house got into the clothes. And when they would go to church, people would shun them and sit alone by themselves. And they just figured that it was just church folks jealous of their success. And when they would go to board meetings, the board 
in the boardroom, they'd have a section for them to sit and they just figured, well, you know, since we are the heads of the company, this is how it's supposed to be done. Well, the truth of the matter is that they stunk. <laughs> and nobody wants to hang out with anybody that stinks. The moral of the story is this, if you don't take the trash out, the trash will ultimately take you out. <laughs> Turn to your neighbor and say, take out the trash. Come on, look at them with authority and say, take out the trash. Get rid of the stuff. Get rid of the junk. Just, just clean it out. Spring is coming. Clean it out. Clean it out. Come on, repeat after me. Say, clean it out. In 2 Timothy chapter number 2, verse number 19, it says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure, having the seal. The Lord knows those that are his. Let every man that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. I want to read that again. Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure. Having this seal, having this assurance, the Lord knows those that are his. Here comes the challenge. Let every man that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Verse number 20, but in the great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, some to honor and some to dishonor. The challenge again, if a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel of honor, meet for the master's use and prepared to every good work. Bless your word this morning, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. When I look at the word iniquity, the easiest way to look at it is sin. But we want to go a little, take a closer look at it and really see what iniquity is. Iniquity is willful deviations from what we know to be the truth of God. Yes. You've gathered the information, you have the proof, you, 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 you know what's right, and then in your own will, you stray away. Willful deviations from what we know to be the truth of God. The text says, nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure. Having this seal, the Lord knows those that are his. He's not talking to sinners. He's talking to the blood wash. He knows those that are his. But then he challenges those that are his to depart from willful deviations from what we know to be the truth of God. Can I preach for a little while? willful deviations from what we know to be the truth of God. He that knoweth to do good and do it not to him, it's a sin. You know what is wrong and you know what is right. Huh? Time now for us to focus on serving, loving God and presenting a clear message to the world of who Jesus is. Our greatest sermon is our lifestyle. I'm going to say that again. Our greatest sermon is our lifestyle. One more time. Our greatest sermon is our lifestyle. One of the greatest problems with the church today is that many of us have the spiritual thing going on, but we don't have the Christian thing going. The sign of the cross. Somebody say the sign of the cross. The sign of the cross is like this. The first staff of the cross is our relationship as it relates to God. It is the spiritual thing. We pray to God, God ministers back to us. It is personal. It has nothing to do with the other person. The Christian part of the cross is the cross of it, which is shoulder to shoulder, Christian to Christian. Now, we got the spiritual thing down pat. We speak in tongues. We shout. We dance. We testify and test a lie. We prophesize and prophet try. We do all of these things, and yet our lives are not changing the lives of other individuals. I did not come to excite you. I came to drop off a serious package today. Jesus wants your life he wants your life to be a living example of holiness, of righteousness, and of godliness, and it has nothing to do with the quickening that you feel. Quickening is all right. That's good. 
But what are you going to do after, hey, that's over? What are you going to do? Many of us inside the church are the recipients of demonic transfers. Let me explain that to you. I don't want to get crazy because, you know, when you start talking about demons, then the folks who didn't take their medication starts talking to you. You got some folks in the church that didn't take their medication today, and they think it's demons. No, it's your medication, baby. Get your medication. Touch your neighbor and say, get your medication. Your medication will... <laughs> I want to talk about an evil spirit. You woke up this morning, you jumped into your car, you was feeling good. You got up early. For the first time, you got up early. You say you're going to the first service. You ain't dragging in here in the last service. So glad I'm here in Jesus' name. No, you're going to the first one. And so you got up early and there was wonderful music playing. It wasn't all that stuff to make you move. and It was good Christian music. You know, there's two types of music that goes on in the church. There's the music that ministers to your soul and helps you to open up to minister back to God. And then that's the music that the young folks listen to. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Well, you get inside your car and you pop a tape in the car and you're listening to the music, you're, you're fine, you're happy, you can't wait to get inside the church. You are ready for church this morning and immediately upon walking into the building, an usher at the door. <laughs> or a person that didn't take their medication <laughs> sees you and you rushing in because you know you got to get in to get a seat. So you're focused. You're trying to get in. You're not trying to be funny. You're not trying to be all that. You, you happy. You know that God has something for you this morning. Instead of this crazy person saying, praise the Lord, they say, wait a minute. Oh, I know you're not going to walk past me and don't speak. Oh, dear. The devil is alive. Now joy that you had from 7 a.m. in the morning has left you because you become the proprietor of a demonic transfer. The person transfers their rage into you. Y'all don't want to tell the truth in here, but it's the truth. We got that spiritual thing going. I've seen people speak in tongues and still beat your God blessed amen up and still keep their quickening. I've seen folks tell people off and go, hey. The Lord. You know I'm telling the truth. Let me move quickly. Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure. The Lord knows that you belong to him. You ain't got to prove nothing to nobody. You ain't to wear your Christian badge and wear your buttons and have, you know, you ain't got to do all that. He knows those that are his. The challenge is for those that belong to him to practice righteousness and godliness. You know, all we do in the churches, you know, in, in many of the circles that I preach, and all they do is talk about fornication and adultery and so on and so forth. There's a whole lot of other things that people have gotten delivered from and don't have no problem with that no more, but they, 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 they just mean, just arrogant, just got the big head, just downright jealous. Are you with me here? Now, much of what is revealed to you in Scripture comes out of your personal experience. Nor hardly ever does anyone see truth without some relation to an experience. See, I'm from Brooklyn, New York. Although I live in North Carolina, I'm from Brooklyn, New York. I'm from Red Hook Projects. I'm from the projects, y'all. I don't care how saved you get and how successful you become. When you come from the projects, there's some experiences that you carry with you. I ain't studying none of y'all that acting like you don't know what I'm talking about because I can look at some of you and tell you come from the projects too. 
You was raised on government cheese and government butter too. And peanut butter too. And you sit up in here if you want to, all fine and sophisticated. I can tell, I can tell that you've been hitting that peanut butter can. I can tell. I was raised on government cheese, government butter. They had lunch meat. The government surplus truck used to come by Bishop and give those big cans of lunch meat. And, and they, they call it spam now. I hate spam. We used to have spam and eggs and spam and spaghetti. Can I preach like this for a little while? That, but most folks refuse to remember where they come from. See, you ain't always been like this. There's a few of us that remember you when you first came into the church. You had that much hair. You had that much hair, polyester dress. You ain't had no nails because you was nervous. Say amen, somebody. And every time they hit a key on the organ, you was jumping up and down, shouting all over the place. Now the Lord done blessed you. You done bought some hair. Changed your eyes. Got nail tips. And we can't even get a hallelujah out of you. You done changed that praise. It used to be hallelujah. Now it's hallelujah. to get to my message I'm trying to get to my message but I'm trying to straighten you out first those of you that didn't come from the project you came across the street from the project six of one half a dozen of the other we were all in the hood say amen somebody and a lot of times if you forget where the Lord has brought you from you can't help nobody how you gonna help me and you won't even remember where the Lord has brought you from you know, what the songwriter said, roll back the curtains of memories now and then show me where I started from and where I could have been. Do you know if the Lord would have rolled back the curtains and show you where you could have been had it not been for him who is now in your life? Would nobody have to tell you to say thank you, Jim? You go crazy in here. If the Lord would have show you where you would have ended up had it not been for him, had he not prepared spiritual blessings for you in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, had he not laid the tracks of your life, there are those of you in here that would have not made it, but thanks be to God that giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Turn to your neighbor and say, I messed up, but I made it. Look at your neighbor and say, I messed up, but I made it. Just let somebody say, remember. One writer says, memory faucets gratitude. The reason why most people are not thankful is because they have a short memory. They forgot where the Lord has brought them from. Verse number 20. It says, in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth. Some of them are to honor and some to dishonor. The challenge, if a man therefore purge himself from these things, from things, from, the, from, 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 from just the message of prosperity, get, 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 get. Purge yourself from that. From just the message of deliverance. I need to get free, I need to get free. All the time, sinners can't come to the altar, saints up there trying to get free. Healing, running from crusade to crusade to crusade to crusade to crusade, trying to get healed. Purge yourself from these things and ask God to place your feet on a sure foundation to give you spiritual balance. Understand that if you're going to be a great Christian, the task of your life is to live so before other individuals that they want to know how you do what you do. In the name of the Lord how come when you touch this it turns to gold and they've been touching it for a long time and nothing has happened let's let's, let's forget the shout and the dance for a few minutes let's forget the experience at the at the water let's talk about what you're doing since you've been saved let's talk about your good dealings and let's talk about integrity let's talk about accountability let's talk about paying me my five dollars back that you owe me how about talk about that we do all this spiritual stuff and we don't want to do the right thing. Imagine with me for a little while a great house. Immediately upon walking into a great house, a mansion, every piece that is in the mansion is strategically placed to invoke conversation. A person that is building a mansion is not going to put junk inside the place. He's going to be a world traveler. He's going to be someone with great experiences. So when he buys a flower, it has meaning to it. A picture, meaning to it. 
China, meaning to it. Everything, Persian rugs and carpets and chandeliers flown in from Greece. Spanish brass. You name it, it is in the house because every piece is strategically placed to invoke conversation. He doesn't have to figure out what to talk about. If you come to his house and you look at a picture, wow, look at that bird. Don't come from the project and go, you'd be like, whoa, that's really nice. And each piece has some sort of a story to it. And it's up to the owner of the house to determine what is old versus what is antique. What is old versus antique? An antique is a piece of old furniture that has a lot of stories attached to it. After all, Roosevelt sat in this chair. Kennedy wrote from this pen. Presidents walked on this carpet. It has history to it. We're not talking about the old chair that is in your den, the one that you fall up in there and eat chicken and wipe your hands on the side of the chair. <laughs> We're talking about antiques. When a person comes into your house, they walk into this great house, and immediately upon walking, they walk into a foyer and write out of the ceiling is a chandelier that forces them to look up. The chandelier is going to tell a story by itself. It's telling you the arches, the fine craftsmanship that has gone into the house. They don't just put a beautiful chandelier up there, they put it up there to light the foyer, but also to force you to look at the architecture of the house. Something has gone into this. Wow! Steps coming down, draped, into the foyer. You look in one section and there's a library. In the other section, there's sitting parlors. They begin to carry you around the house and they show you the dining room, China from China. They show you wonderful silverware. They show you all the stuff. In showing you all the pieces inside this great house, no one takes it upon themselves to show you dishonorable vessels. It's only the vessels that bring splendor to the house. And walking into the house, there's wonderful white carpet. You walk in and you're in awe. You almost don't want to step on it because your feet is dirty. But what about the piece of rug that's on the outside of the door that displays the word called saying, welcome? Had it not been for him, uh, that beautiful white pearly carpet could have not kept its purity. And the welcome mat that you step on and dust your feet on, he's not even, although his word says welcome, he's not even welcome in the house. The maid tells him, take the cleaning boy, take the mat around the back of the house, beat it, and put it back. Can you imagine being stepped on and beaten and stepped on and beaten so that other folks can be welcomed in? What are you complaining about? You are a vessel of dishonor. The scripture is not saying that you're no good. The scripture is saying that you got a greater test and a greater task because the dishonorable vessel is the vessel that brings honor to the honorable vessels. Without me, you couldn't be where you are. You know, the people who clean up this church knows a little bit more about all of you that is in here. If they, if they come in here and take time and look at where you've been sitting. Then when you leave to pick up your trash, he know a little bit about you. You want to find out about somebody? Scrounge through their trash can. All right. The problem is that everybody that enters into this particular house, in this mansion, this great house, goes in a chandelier, comes out an old chandelier. That's the problem. But in God's house, God's house is a house of transformation. Romans says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed, that's where I want to go, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, God's house is a house of transformity. God's house is a house where you can be transformed. In a natural house, whatever you go in as, that's what you come out as. But in God's house, you can go in there, bathroom paper, and leave cloth napkins. In God's house, you can go in there as a garbage pail 
and leave a washing machine. In God's house is a place of transformation. And that's the place that we want to get the people of God to. Listen to me as I close. It's very important for you to understand that when a preacher preaches to you, a great deal of what he's saying comes out of his experience. Look with me for a few minutes. I was raised in Brooklyn, New York City, and I had a $200 a day, by some accounts, $300 a day cocaine habit. I snatched pocketbooks. I did everything that I needed to do in, in order to keep my addiction intact. I went to detox schools. I went to day top detox school in New York City. No help. I, 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 I promised that I wouldn't snort no more cocaine. No help. I, 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 the methadone thing came and no help. Every single time I would make a promise, I would find myself right back in that same predicament. Until one day I met Jesus. I went to the house of transformation. It wasn't step one, step two, step three, and I'm not knocking that because there are people that need steps. Say amen, somebody. Thank God for the steps. But, 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 but listen to my point. All of the preaching of the gospel means nothing if you don't have a personal experience with the man Christ Jesus. You got to have an experience with him. You got to have an experience with him. So one day I found myself in Rackers Island Prison in my processing chamber, locked up locked up so that God could get his yes out of me he wanted to take a dirty doormat and turn it into a Persian carpet I had to go through the process of being stepped on and beat, beat up for a little while but it's all good now because the Lord has done a work in my life whereof I am glad surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. My challenge to you this morning is that you rise up and become a Christian. I'm not talking about speaking in tongues and shouting. I'm talking about loving other individuals. I'm talking about showing forth. You come here for this experience, share it with somebody else. And allow the Lord to change you. With your heads bowed, your eyes closed. Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity today of ministry to your people so needed so timely but we recognize that there are those who are doormats and need the changing power the transformation power of the Lord Jesus active in their life this morning let the convicting power of the Holy Spirit move throughout this congregation that such would be saved today in Jesus name amen and amen put your hands together as Bishop comes back for the altar call